So in today's video, we are taking a kitchen that's about 10 years old, that was a builder kitchen, has a nice style, but we're gonna give it a facelift and remodel this thing into something that's beautiful that you're gonna to wanna to cook in. I think we're gonna increase value in this kitchen. This is not acceptable. And that is money in the bank. This is where it gets fun. Fire in the hole! <sighs> it's not the time to be putting out the big dollars. Thank you, hero. Here's another tool you won't need to buy. Perfect, every time. So this homeowner, Maria, is actually planning on selling this property sometime in the next six months. And so she contacted me because she had a few projects she wanted to get it done. And she wanted to consult with me about other things that she could do that would help improve either the value of the home or the, make the process of selling it easier by being more competitive on the market. So what we decided is that we're gonna take these solid wooden cabinets. Now this is actually an oak and it's been whitewashed, stained. Um, and we're gonna take these and remove the doors and we're gonna actually sand them down and repaint them. And by painting, that gives us complete control over the surface, the texture, and the color. And that gives us all kinds of design options. So we're gonna show you how to do that process. We're also gonna put in a brand new backsplash. This is a builder tile. It's what I call biscuit. It's really, really thin. And it's basically just there to provide occupancy permit because you have to have some sort of waterproof wall on behind the sink in the kitchen. So it's design wise, it's almost useless. So we're gonna put in a brand new subway tile back there and we're gonna show you how to do that. And our secret there is actually kind of funny. We're gonna go right over top of this and use this as our wallboard. And that's how we're gonna get away with doing it quick and simple without making a lot of mess. It's a one day project. We're also gonna be removing these counters and putting in some quartz. Now, <clears throat> I know quartz can be a little bit expensive but the reality is in the building market and the sales market in our area, if you don't have a natural stone or a quartz countertop, it is really hard to compete when you're selling your house because that is becoming the standard of the norm. So if you have 10 homes for sale in a neighborhood and you're trying to sell your house without a new upgraded kitchen countertop, you're gonna find yourself at the bottom end of the market and you're not gonna get the demand to get good pricing on your home. So this is an important investment to make and we're gonna get that done. So we're also gonna change the floor. She has a real simple vinyl lay floor here. We're gonna remove that. We're gonna put in a luxury vinyl plank. It's gonna modernize and update everything. So when we're all done, we have a couple of expenses, but overall, I think we're gonna increase value in this kitchen, but more importantly, we're gonna create an environment. So when you walk in, you're gonna go, wow, what a beautiful kitchen. I want this house. And that'll ensure that she has multiple offers on her home. And that's how you make money when you sell. So one of the most dramatic things that you can do in your home for increasing not only just the value, but its physical appearance and your durability is to paint your kitchen cabinets. <sighs> so let's get into this because there's a lot of ground to cover. There are a lot of different kinds of cabinets that are made. And let's start with the doors because you have two basic things going on. You have a door and you've got the box. In this case, our door is solid wood and our box is a melamine or a particle board with a, a, a vinyl finish on it. Okay, so you have a lot of different kinds of surfaces that all need to be treated differently when you're painting your project. <sighs> Wood, you use light sanding. With the vinyl, you have to go extremely light sanding and you have to use the right kind of primer. So we'll get into all those products later in the project, but for now, let's start from the beginning and what you need to do to prep your kitchen. First of all, here we go. what we need to do is we need to remove all the doors. Start in the top left, just like reading a book. Left to right, and you number everything off. You don't have to readjust all your doors and drawers after you reinstall them because they're going to be able to be in the same condition as they're in now. Most of the hardware nowadays is really simple. It has a quick release tab in the back, okay, and you can just pop it off. So we want to remove all the hardware from all of our surfaces, and that's as simple as pulling the screws. These little plastic things here are actually really, really important. They're like a plug that's in the oak wood to receive the screw. So when we're refinishing these cabinets, we wanna leave these plugs alone. The only thing I would suggest is remove the little tabs that are on here that keep the door from being really noisy when you close it. And you wanna remove your handle. And 
pull the screw out. There we go. If you want to keep the hardware and put the same hardware back on, you're going to save a lot of steps. But if your hardware dates your kitchen and you want to put in something new, then you have an opportunity. You can save this hole and drill a new hole with new hardware later. Or if you already have pulls on your doors and you have two holes, buy hardware with the same dimension on it. Okay, so it's, if it's a three inch by three inch handles, and that way you won't have to do any filling and sanding and, and repairing of the door before you get moving forward. What you want to have, have your Ziploc bag. I prefer the freezer bags because they're really hardy. And, <laughs> and you just throw all that in there. This is really important because all of your doors and drawers that are in here are going to be set, especially for that piece of the cabinet. Very unique. So you can see it doesn't take long to pull a kitchen apart if you got the quick release. Then you just spend more time on the other side taking all the hardware off the doors. But this is it. Now your kitchen is prepped. Now drawers are a little bit different because there's a drawer face and then there's a drawer. And we want to remove the face from the drawer itself. We want to remove these screws only halfway. Well, would you look at that. These drawer faces are not just screwed on, they are stapled on as well. So unfortunately, if I try to take that door face off, I'm gonna run the risk of damaging this drawer itself. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish these drawer faces attached to their cabinet. When we come and take care of all of these other parts of the facade, well, we're gonna take all the doors off site these are actually a lot simpler to finish because they don't have all the detail. All right, so this is actually quite easy to sand with a palm sander. One of the reasons I want to take all of the drawer, door faces away and take it to my shop is because the contour in this panel, it takes a lot of work actually to take the stain and get the finish off of there and do it effectively. So that requires a little bit more precision than just throwing a palm sander on it. And I want to have it in a different environment this is going to be simple. I can set up my palm sander on a vacuum, come in and give this a good scuff with the transition primer, and it'll perform just fine. But this, this is a lot more work, trying to make sure all these nooks and crannies here are filled in and sanded properly. So I'm just going to finish taking the rest of my doors off, get them loaded into my truck to take back to my workshop, and then we'll meet you back there to continue on with the process of how to prep these things up and get them all painted. So we're back at the shop now and I'm going to go through all the steps that are necessary in order to take it from this to a beautiful piece of finished painted wood. So we're just going to spray that on liberally and we're just going to wipe it off with our blue shop towels. Now we're ready to sand. We're just looking to scuff this up so that we have a texture that will receive our transition primer. If you're going to use an orbital sander, of course we have to take precaution. There's a lot of fine dust being kicked out by that. Woo! Like a glove. Generally speaking, the back of the door doesn't get a lot of wear and tear, but it's that one time, if you don't sand this before you do your transition primer, it's that one time a plate or a ring from someone's hand is going to scratch across that. If you don't prep it properly, it's going to disappoint you. So take the time and do it right. When you're done sanding, take a, your cloth, put a little bit of your degreaser on there, and just wipe over your surface. Basically, what you're doing is just trying to remove the dust and the debris from the surface. That's all, so that our transition primer isn't gonna be competing with the dust that's on there. Okay, so now we've got our sanding finished. It's time for our transition primer. My paint tray is a disaster, and I am out of liners. So I'm gonna show you a paint trick. Oh my goodness. Take your paint tray, put it in the garbage bag. Instant liner, okay. If you don't own a 5-in-1 tool and you're going to paint, go buy one. This uh, cleans rollers, opens cans, uh, helps to repair the drywall, puts dents so you can fill them up, and it is the easiest way to open up a can of paint. Here we go. Brush and roll, right? So the idea is, like anything else, you want to fill up inside the brush, okay? And then take the extra off. Less is more, and you want to paint from inside the brush, not the outside. It'll reduce your drips, okay? And the whole point here, start in the edge, 
and you work your way towards the middle from both corners. This is my new favorite friend. I love this product, I've been using it for years. Anytime I'm doing a minor patch or a stain kill or anything, then I need a good solid primer. My favorite trick for this is actually an old set of stairs. I can spray all of this down on the oil paint and then finish a couple of coats of latex over top of it and make it look brand new. And this is a shellac base paint, and it is like a spray paint. Of course, in order to finish your priming, you can use the brush on these edges here. Once I have all five sides done, I am going to pull out this thing here, my trusty roller, and I'm gonna roll the inside. I've already got lint, that's great. Now you'll see the process here. You're gonna have a lot more paint on here than you want, okay? And this is the danger, and this is why I'm showing you the hard way first. So the way you solve this problem of having too much paint on a door is sand all your doors first, and then when they're ready to go, cut all of your edges. Then go back and put some paint on, and then go to the next door. Do two or three at once with the full roller, and then you can come back and stretch it all out. Just a quick run. Okay, now the same thing with the door. I'm using a 10 mil roller, and this one I didn't load up. You'll see how there's hardly any paint on there. Same thing. I'm going to take the time to stretch this out for the purpose of our demonstration here. I don't want to run it up against the hedges. So the other type of process that you're going to see in your kitchen uh, most wooden kitchens are going to have uh, fillers, valances, um, microwave shelves like this one here. And in most cases, or even the exposed side of a cabinet, most cases the price point that kitchens are purchased at, you're not going to get these in solid wood and stained. A lot of the fillers and, and, and miscellaneous trim boards are all basically an MDF material with a vinyl skin. We'll call it plastic, okay? so. You can't take a mechanical sander or a 220 and sand that down. It'll just eat a hole right through the thing and you're gonna run into trouble. So what you wanna do is take some steel wool. Now this is not the coarse stuff. This is actually for fine woodworking. And this is what we're gonna use here. We're actually gonna just rub it in circles. And the idea here is we're gonna allow this steel wool to create our bonding texture for our primer. And you can roll. Okay, the fact that this is even rolling means there's texture on there. If there was no texture, it would just slide across like a big schmear. But the fact that I can dry roll this means that that worked. And again, what we're doing here is we're relying on the technology of the materials that we're using. We're not relying on the texture of the surface. This transition primer, once it gets a chance to bond properly and, and cure, and your finished coat of paint gets a chance to cure, You'll be able to put this microwave shelf back on, and slide your microwave in place, and it's not gonna cause any damage at all. Okay, so we are back on the job site today. Today is the day we have to handle all of these little miscellaneous elements. Okay, so we're gonna remove the hood fan because we have skins on both sides and just a little bit of space, but not enough to get a brush and roller in there. <clears throat> so, like an idiot, I forgot my degreaser today when I came. Lucky for me, the client had her TSP. So it's just a part mix with warm water and we don't need a lot of scrubbing here. We're just going to make sure that our surface is somewhat clean. So the next step of course is the sand and this is 150 grit. Okay, so like this you maybe can't see what you're doing but if you go circular Going up against the wall, just fold your paper in half and put your hand in the way so it acts like a guide so you're not going to scratch the wall. Set that and go. So again, this is our transition primer and we're going to run the brush line down the side of that cabinet. But basically, there you go. With a little bit of pressure, you want to just kind of move whatever paint you have there around. When you're done your surface, take a cloth Set it up and just do a quick run down each edge. 
Better to do it now. It's hard to clean this transition primer off later if you find it, <laughs> but keep it clean as you go because it is a transition primer and this really bonds to just about anything. So we're prepping our drawer by removing the door hardware. This is usually the dirtiest part on any cabinet, is right around the handle. And I'm going to suggest not using a roller on all these edges. Are you going to create so many drips that have to be cleaned up? You'll just be going running around in circles. So once again, I'm using a garbage bag as a tray liner. <laughs> I love my garbage bags. But this roller fell into the big soup. So I'm using the 5 one the curve edge. And I'm literally trying to take out as much of this paint as I can. Okay. Off this roller before I paint the door face. So now that we have this pretty much dried out, I'm not even using any pressure. Look at how much paint is coming off that roller. Okay, so now when I apply pressure, it's in order to get coverage, and I'm not going to be forcing paint to be dripping off all the edges. All right, you know, Max wants to see if I can do this left-handed. Well, it's not as easy. I just got to hold myself still. Uh, but the same concept applies. Clean, just brush from inside. And it's all about technique here, not speed. I am not left-handed. All of our skins have got the primer on. It's all nice and dry. Just a little tip when you're working with your paint. Pour out enough that you'd only leave about an inch, inch and a half in the bottom of the can. That's perfect. Because now my brush, I can force it into there. Clean off all the paint that's on the edges. And the only thing that's left is paint that's inside the brush, not on the outside. And that is how you cut. And that is our color. Paint on my hand. This is like a really sticky paint. Yeah, you don't want to get it all over yourself when you work. There we go. Okay. Sorry, now in order to finish the coat, I want to just put a little bit of paint on each of the inside of these doors. Now I want to just back roll until the coverage is really nice. I don't know how well the camera picks this up. Because we're dealing with a natural wood, there are some areas here where this joint is. You can see some light brown staining coming through. And generally speaking, that's just the sap from the oak. It's very here and there. Oh, there's a lot of it on this corner here. Wow, yeah, that really shows. You can see that? It's a water-based product that, I'll, that bonds to oil. So it's not a sealer the same way that a stain blocker would work. So what you're going to find is when you're done, you want to give yourself about a week, maybe even two. And then all these little spots are going to show up. And that's not a problem because all you do is you get a stain sealer. And I like to use aerosol kills. It's a shellac based product. It's the same product I use to seal all of the detail. Like you can see this, this was done in kills. No dark yellow. Where the kills didn't show up, that the stain comes through. So we'll wait and find out where all the stains are that come through. And there might be just a few spots. It might be all over the place. It doesn't really matter. There we go. Now, the only other thing that has to be done, of course, is putting the door hardware on. I'm going to wait till the next day to come back and do that because I don't want to risk damaging the surface while I'm messing around with the hardware. Well, that's pretty much it. We're just finishing the last coat on the last couple of doors here. We're going to be back in a couple of weeks. We'll tag this on the video. But we're going to come back and do the stain blocking. I know that's going to be an issue. I see some places already, even after 24 hours. There's bound to be a few more issues that'll poke up heads up by then. So we'll just wait to deal with it all at the same time.
Okay, so it has been about a week and a half since we started this project. Most of the work though, up until this point, has been done off-site back at our shop. We moved all of the doors, did all the refinishing work, and now we're back in the site. We've got them installed and touched up, and we've got the handles all put in. We've reinstated the hood fan. Yesterday, of course, our quartz guy came by and he installed our new countertop. Now, these guys are awesome because they brought in their laser leveling equipment and they are actually able to measure all the details to follow along the contour of this wall. So if you wanted to, in this environment, you could actually just put in a solid color uh, silicone seal and you could call that finished. Brilliant. You can actually remove a laminate countertop, replace it with stone, and you don't have to have a big nasty gap or redo any tile. But since we're getting this place uh, a brand new facelift from bottom to top, we're going to do a new backsplash, so we have that left to do. So for mica tops, let's just talk countertops for a second, because a lot of homes are made with a formica top kitchen. And there's a reason for it. The stuff is durable. It comes in a variety of different colors and textures and glazes, and you can get just about any look you want with formica. And the price point is usually about $20 to $25, a linear foot of counter space. That's why it's used. But we're going to transform this because it seems like the new normal nowadays is to have some sort of natural stone. And that's a bit of an oxymoron because we're going back with quartz on this job, which is not natural at all. It's a man-made stone. And you need to understand that if you're using man-made stone in your kitchen, it's been made with a resin and it does not handle heat very well. So make sure you never put a hot pot on your quartz. That being said, let's show you how to remove this stuff. And it's really quite simple. Again, we're cutting silicone. It's amazing how much silicone is used in a house. All right, so for the most part, countertops are installed with gravity. But because Formica is installed on a particle board and it is not always flat, it is screwed down. But it's not screwed from the surface, it's screwed from underneath. So as long as you know where to look, usually four corners, a screw like this, and nothing in the back corner. Well, that was awfully nice of them. Here's a screw here. Oh, I love a good fight. I usually end up with a black eye though. Here we go. Ta-da! So this little piece of man-made love, probably about 100 pounds? Yep, maybe 120. Now, we're dealing with a lot of precision here. Not a lot of room for error. Now what we're going to do is we're going to throw a couple of dabs of the sealing bond in the back corners. Not that it needs a whole lot of help. And throw a little squeeze in here too. And that is an installed countertop. Amazing how simple that is. <laughs> so if you're updating your kitchen and you're changing your countertops, just remember that you have a few options. Uh, you've got, of course, your Formica, and there are luxury versions of Formica, so don't discount that. Because like I said, it's about $25 on the high side per linear foot of countertop, where generally speaking, granite and quartz start at around the $50 to $60 range per square foot. You're also paying for all the waste and offcut, okay? So it's not as simple as just measuring out your counter. If you have any turns, they're gonna be cutting that out of another piece of stone, and you're going to be buying all the stone that's used in the production process. So keep that in mind. You also have to deal with two things. The man-made stuff, the quartz, lovely to have for ease of maintenance. You don't have to use a sealer and it doesn't take any maintenance. But what it does take is discipline. <laughs> you can't get it hot. You can't put a hot pot on this because the resin will melt and it'll leave a mark. The natural stone, although it takes a sealer, it's just a surface sealer, usually applied every two or three years takes about 10 minutes, not a big deal, but you can put hot pots on granite and you'll never hurt that surface. The other thing is with granite, if you ever get a chip or a crack or any other kind of damage, you can call up your granite pro from Ottawa Granite Pro and he can come out and he can do a surface repair on site while you wait and you'll never even notice your damage ever again. The guy's amazing. Okay, so the reason we are covering stone countertops, granite quartz and otherwise as a DIY video, which is kind of strange because you can't do your own countertop in this material. The reason I'm covering this is because when you go to talk to your countertop company about this kind of material, there's a few things that they're not going to do for you. Number one, they're not going to remove your old countertops for you without charging an arm and a leg. Number two, they're not going to disengage your old plumbing and remove it out of the way 
at all. Most of these companies won't assume any liability dealing with the plumbing, so you're going to have to be in charge of your own plumbing. So you're going to have to know how to disconnect, turn the water supply off, remove your faucet, and then reinstate all the plumbing again when you're done. <sighs> this can take a lot of time, all right? And if you don't know how to do it, then it is not a DIY, then you're hiring three different professionals to come and work in your home, and this becomes a very expensive process. But the reality is, this whole brand new kitchen area here, including these two pieces of quartz that are seamed together perfect, you can't even see it, unbelievable. This whole project here was just around $2,000. And since we're gonna do our own plumbing, it's not a problem, very affordable. And since that's the new standard in new homes today, good luck trying to sell an old house with old counters. Because anybody who comes into your kitchen is going to see and go, oop, guess we're gonna have to find a house that's got a finished kitchen. Most people don't want to renovate after they just finished buying. So now that the counters are in, all that's left for us is a couple of finishing touches. We are going to do our new backsplash. And of course, the flooring guy called our floor that we ordered is in stock. So now we're going to pick that up and get that in the next day. So now that we're back in Maria's house, we've got probably three, maybe four days worth of work to do to completely redo her kitchen. And we're not invading her space that much. But today is the day we got to finish her plumbing. This sink was installed yesterday with structural silicone and epoxy, so no problems there. We're going to finish off the plumbing, let her have the house for the weekend, get her life back organized again, and then we'll get back here on Monday or Tuesday and finish this project up. So all in all, not bad. Brand new facelift, brand new kitchen, about three or four days invasion to the home. That's a good way to do things. So traditionally, with doing a backsplash in the kitchen, if you have existing tile, you've got two options. A lot of these things, they're just put on with an adhesive. But you know what? When you're building new houses, they do the adhesive before they even use a primer. That's right. They're right over top of drywall, which means this tile is attached to the paper backing of the drywall. And when you try to rip that off, you're ripping your wall apart. So what most guys in the renovation business have learned is if we just smash it out and cut the drywall top and bottom and replace that whole piece of wall section, and then put on a backsplash, it's actually quicker and easier. But I'll tell you, that is a really huge waste of time. So for a DIY trick, I've got a way to do a tile over the tile. Ah, I know, you're gonna love it. So what we gotta do is just remove all of the electrical stuff, of course, take these bad boys out, because these are gonna be garbage. We're gonna have to use longer screws when we come back. Now, if you don't feel comfortable playing around with live power, <laughs> turn it off. Just go downstairs. Most new homes, the breaker panels are all labeled for kitchen. Um, if not, well, you can always apply some black tape just to make it a little bit safer. I like to live on the wild side. All right, so when I'm doing my backsplash, my simple process is bark garbage bags, believe it or not. When you have nice countertops, you want to do something to protect them while you're working. Tarps are no good to you because they, they're just always sliding off. Garbage bags almost have like this cling effect. It's almost like using saran wrap. And it almost tapes in place. Look at that, how cool is that, eh? Now, a lot of people think that if you're gonna go tile over tile, what you need to do is come over here with some sort of machine and sand the ceramic tile down. And honestly, that may have been true a long time ago, but nowadays in the renovation business, we're relying on uh, technology, not technique. Okay, so boom. You've seen this before if you watch our channel. This is Eco Prime Grip. We use this as a uh, floor leveler primer. Uh, I can convert um, sheet vinyl flooring into a substrate that I can tile over on concrete with this primer. I can also use it on existing tile to, to install tile right over top with a cement. And this doesn't look like much. But I'll tell you, when this primer is dry, it is like a rubber surface with grit. It is absolutely amazing. Now remember, this is a dry area, not a wet area. And according to the tile recommendations of the International Brotherhood of Guys Who Like to Tile, then we need to get about an 80 to 85% adhesion. So if you don't get every square inch of this stuff on here, don't worry about it. Backsplashes don't get a lot of abuse. Now this stuff dries in about an hour. So do your primer, clean up, walk away, and then you can pull out all your tools and get set up for doing your backsplash. 
by the time you're all said and done, this should be dry and ready to go. I'm loving this product because it makes life quick and simple. If I was to take a, do a demolition approach here and then a reinstall, it would probably take me better part of half a day just to be at the same place as I'm going to be in here in about 15 minutes. Just about done. We are going to go grab a coffee while this stuff dries. And when we come back, we'll show you how to install. And this is beautiful. This is a subway tile we're going to use. It's like a two by 12, I believe. It's a ceramic. It's very simple. It's going to have a little bit of depth of color in the gray scheme. So it'll really nicely tie everything together. I'm so excited about this ceramic tile, three bucks a square foot for backsplash. That's the way to go. So this is the stone that we picked out. This is a ceramic tile, it's two by 10. It's very simple, very, it's got a beveled edge, which is nice. So you get the little bit of texture on the wall with a nice cleaning surface. And, and I love this because I'd love to be able to show a very simple combination of tools for doing work at home. Here's my little tile cutter. It's a Brutus cutter. It's designed for 12 inch stone, great for backsplash. Um, I'm gonna need a drill with a number one Robertson bit. All of these electrical switches and plugs need to be backed out and pulled away from the wall. Just some tape, a marker, knife, float, and a trowel, and my spacers. And of course, measuring tape. And you were in business. So with the basic tools, you can be able to do stonework yourself. The only thing that's missing here is our grinder. It's set up outside. We're gonna cut all of our stone with the grinder outside, just so we don't put that dust in our atmosphere here. All right, so when you're doing a backsplash tile, you don't need a whole lot of tool, just a small pail. You can use your grout mixing blade here. All right, that'll work fine. We're just gonna make a half a pail of cement. Just on low speed. That is missing almost a half gallon of water. Ultralight should be more of a consistency like whipped cream not like a cement. Now that is more what I'm looking for. All right, time for a quick recap. Now our cement has been sitting for 10 minutes. It's ready to go. We have everything primed. We've got our counters covered with my plastic. This is what I love to do just so I'm not cleaning up a mess later. And I'm not getting hairline scratches from any of my tools, um, especially with quartz. You gotta be real careful actually because a lot of the housing on your tools it's all made with like an aluminum product. And whenever there's a vibration with aluminum, it actually will, will wear off onto the quartz and leaves a mark. Now, there's a cleaning trick for that. Just take Clorox bleach and a little unsanded grout and you can rub those marks out. But why make a mess that so you have to clean up later? Now, just fine. And then, of course, the last thing you have to do, since we're starting in an inside corner and we have six rows of tile, which we've already predetermined, we have to take three of them and cut them in half because we're doing a half offset subway tile pattern. So I put every tile on that same spot. And in case you're just off by a hair, keep your left and right side separate. Just a little scratch and a little pressure and off we go to the racers. It was that simple. No need to have a thousand dollar machine to do that. By the way, a lot of cases, these handles, they have a screw off end with a spare wheel. So <laughs> if you buy a $30 cutter, they already give you a free $8 wheel. But if you don't know about it, you don't know about it. <laughs> and you can see how good the cement is, right? That's got grab. This is why I love to use this because I'm going to be taking this tile straight across the back of the stove area. And this stuff will keep my tile from slipping. So I don't have to put any temporary bracing in place. <laughs> so you can see the technique is simple. You just throw a few blobs on the wall. It's not going anywhere because this is really good cement for this situation. Because <laughs> you're going to want to be able to take your time. That's why this cement is so wonderful. Because it holds everything right to the wall. And it gives you about a 15 to 20 minute working time. Which is lots of time to fuss around here with the cement. And get your stone cut and installed. You don't want to do the entire kitchen at once here. You want to just do a certain area. Now, I'm going to show you this technique. It's very important. When you're putting tile in your kitchen, lift it up and put your first spacer on your counter. Oh, so important. Especially if you live in a zone, a region where you get uh, uh, probably below freezing temperatures. What ends up happening to the house 
is on the outside walls, the, the lumber of your house freezes and starts to warp outwards, okay? As the wood moisture in the wood starts to freeze, it expands. And so a lot of times you'll see in your kitchen, the silicone lines around your kitchen on the outside walls gets cracked and, and the wall separates from the cabinets in the wintertime. So if you put the space here in the wintertime, if you use the right kind of elastomeric caulking, which can grow 400% of what you put on, which is four times the size, you won't get cracking. I'm going to put the half tile. It's a little painstaking like this. Now, if you do a lot of tile with this particular product, you can just come along and set it in place, eyeball it, and give it a press. This is where it gets fun. So you have to kind of eyeball. You want to get nice and down here and see what your height is. I'm going to run outside and grind this real quick. And then we'll come back in and we should be able to finish most of this rest of this wall for the first four or five feet. I think I'm going to need a little bit of a grind on that piece right there, but that'll be about it for the grinder. Other than that, we'll just do a few scratch tools and we'll be done. The benefit of tiling over tile is really obvious. Generally speaking, um, if you're going to remove a backsplash, you have to take the tile off the drywall surface and the drywall gets destroyed. It's really difficult in a lot of cases to remove just the tile. So what most guys do is they'll come in here and they'll quote or they'll remove and cut out all the stone and they'll cut out all the drywall, replace all the drywall. It just creates a whole lot of work. It's about, I would say almost half a day just to remove and reinstall the wall board and then you've got to do the backsplash. And then you've got to grow. It becomes a whole weekend project. Doing it this way, you can do it in an afternoon. And that is a renovation on Saturday and fishing on Sunday. I'm going to show you a technique for working around your faucet. I don't want to be sitting here with this metal trowel messing around trying to just back butter the tile right in your hand. We don't need 100% adhesion here. All right, we're not holding up the house. It's just a little something pretty to put on the wall that's easy to clean. Now because we're tile over tile, you have to be a little bit creative here. So what I've done is I've used my understanding of building materials available at the building store. And we bought some outside angle. And this is aluminum, but it's a brush metal and it matches up with all the brush metals in the room. So what we did was just put a little miter joint on it. We're going to cap it. And this is going to be the finished look. And that is going to look absolutely stunning. Little dab goes a long way. Hot glue is one of these particular products where you don't want to make the glue sit too long before it's pressed into place. So do one piece with the glue, get it installed. Okay, all good. When you're using hot glue, if you see any of this glue sitting out, proud of the trim, just take your knife, trim it back. Now when this is all set up, about an hour or two, we're gonna let it dry, we'll pull out all our spacers, and then we're gonna grout all that in place and we'll add some caulking on the top, paint it in. That'll be spectacular. All right, so now that we have the backsplash done, we're just gonna focus on how we finished off the floor. This is a really great product. This is a vinyl luxury plank with the cork underlay, but instead of the, the long plank that looks like flooring, this is designed to look more like a large porcelain tile. All right, and this is the same sort of thing. It has a click and it just drops in place. So what we're doing here, is you have two options. You can put these together and then you can use a, a hammering or wedging effect to put it all together. But what you're gonna like is this. If you put all pieces together in a row, and we went ahead and measured all this out in advance, you lay all three together, side to side to side. Then you can drop all three pieces in together at once. And we're going to just find that happy place so that all of our trim is going to cover. There we go. Done. It's that simple. Now, uh, last step here. You can see we laid this over top of the existing vinyl. And the reason we left it there is because the thickness of the vinyl plus that underlay and this flooring makes a nice, perfectly smooth transition to the hardwood. 
So what we've got is we went to my favorite flooring supplier and found a piece of trim that matches up with the flooring. We're going to cut it and install it and it just snaps right into that track and then that'll be the finish. This is a great economical way to finish this all off. You get that effect of having that one surface height. We're going to just nail on some trims and then this job is pretty much finished. So wow, what a transformation, right? Uh, this is a really good example of how to renovate or remodel your kitchen economically. We're using all existing materials, no demolition. All of the processes are designed for quick results and it's still fantastic. Like, let's face it, once you put in a new countertop, you are basically giving a brand new life to your kitchen. So here's a tip for you. When you're going for your countertop, bring your measurements. Don't be afraid to ask the countertop guy to show you his offcuts. If you can get your kitchen done in a half a slab that's sitting around and it's just taking up space, he might be in a much better position to strike you a deal. So don't be afraid to negotiate. You could be surprised how much you might get on a discount. Secondly, um, when you're going shopping for something like this, if you're going to be living in your home for a long time, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of extra money on your backsplash. Make sure you're going to be really happy with it. Most of the time and labor and materials in this kitchen are in the countertop. Everything else is just labor intensive, so don't be afraid to spend a few bucks on a good backsplash that makes you happy. Finally, when you're doing your floor, just remember you don't need to peel all the old layers off as long as you're using something that's a loose leg. So if you have vinyl floors existing, check your thicknesses of your new material because you might be surprised you get a great brand new flat transition into the other rooms. And that is actually a much better look than the old one, which had a real ramp on it. So remember, what makes this kitchen such a great DIY is that most of the cost of a kitchen remodel is in the labor. So for instance, the quartz countertops, we struck a deal, right? We got about a $600 off the retail price because they were able to use some offcuts and seamlessly do a joint over here. The cabinets, really $100, a bucket of primer and a bucket of paint and a lot of work, but again, a great transformation. This backsplash, although it's a subway tile, it's got a modern look. It's more rectangular, nice long sleek line with a bit of bevel on it. This tile probably is only about three, three and a half dollars a square foot because it's a ceramic, not a porcelain. So it's a great investment for a modern look. Again, it's labor intensive, but it, it, once you get the hang of it, it's not such a big project. Flooring, again, you pull off the shoe mold, put on a new floor. In one weekend of solid hard work, you can have this transformation complete. And the total cost of this project, I believe, came in under $3,000. That is an amazing kitchen renovation. So thanks for joining us on our Reality Renovision. This is our DIY kitchen. It's a $15,000 upgrade for less than $3,000. And if you like these kinds of videos, don't forget to check our playlist. We've got a lot of great little videos in there for different kinds of projects. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And like this video if you like this kind of content. We want to hear from you. And if you have any questions, by all means, throw them in the comment section. We're still answering every one of those questions every single day. Look forward to hearing from you soon. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Reality Renovision. If you're new to our channel, then I suggest you subscribe to the channel over here. Don't forget to hit the bell icon for notifications so you'll be told every time a new video comes up. And if you'd like, you can click the link right here and you can binge watch all the episodes that we have on our playlist. Amazing information, everything DIY and decor and renovation and remodeling. Thanks for joining us.